Good evening, everybody. Respectful homage to His Holiness, all the spiritual teachers, dignitaries, and all the participants. Since we started 30 minutes late, we'll go on until 3.30, so the speakers should not be worried about their time. So today we have two speakers. The first speaker is Kim Shonat Ridge. Dr. Kim is an applied developmental psychologist and a professor in the human development, learning and culture area in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and a special education at the University of British Columbia. She is also the director of the Human Early Learning Partnership in the School of Population and Public Health in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Dr. Kim is a renowned expert in the area of social and emotional learning, research with children and adolescents, particularly in relation to the identification of the processes and mechanisms that foster positive human qualities, such as empathy, compassion, altruism, resilience. She is an, also an advisor with our new program of teaching secular ethics education. And then we have uh, Geshe Lop Sangdenzi as the next speaker. Geshe La is a professor of practice in Emory University's Department of Religion and the founder and spiritual director of Depong Loseling Monastery in Atlanta. He's also the co-founder and director of the Emory Tibet Partnership, a unique multidimensional initiative founded at Emory University. And one of the latest very ambitious work that Geshe La is spearheading is teaching secular ethics education, and it's Geshila's credit that we are able to make a move of this new initiative. And then we have uh, two uh, panelists, uh, Geshinga Wang Samdin, Venerable Professor Geshinga Wang Samdin is the Vice Chancellor of the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies in Sarnath, Varanasi. And uh, Geshila is also intimately involved uh, in implementing His Holiness Dalai Lama's vision for secular ethics in education in India and academic institutions. And then we have uh, Tim. Tim is an assistant director at the Emory Tibet Partnership, where he coordinates two of its education programs. The newest is the social, emotional, and ethical development, an educational framework for teaching compassion based ethics beginning in the kindergarten and continuing through high school, and the other is CBCT, Cognitively Based Compassion Training, a contemplative method for cultivating compassion in a secular context based on Lojong techniques. So this session is the last session, and a very important session, session related to secular ethics education. So as a moderator, I should not be speaking much, but I'm really tempted to say a few words because I'm also involved in this program. And uh, I would like to say just a few points as a kind of reminder to all the participants how important this secular ethics education is. And one of the most favorite examples that I always give in my talks around the world is that if you observe the nature, why secular ethics education is important, after the birth of the child, the first thing the child does is crying. And by crying, the child is asking for something. And I'm almost 100% sure that the child is not asking for lengthy teaching on Buddhism <laughs> or Christianity or any religion. The child is asking for secular ethics, meaning that the child is asking for somebody's love that is also primarily unconditional love. So just this kind of example will you know, tell us clearly how important this kind of secular ethics education is. Because sometimes human beings have a tendency to forget the most basic important things and then grasp onto the less relevant and the secondary issues like which country you belong to, which nationality you belong to, you know, what kind of language you speak, what kind of religion you follow. So we forget the most important thing. So it's important to remember the most important thing. And then also human beings have a tendency to hang on to what is 
material, what is physical, and forgetting the mind, because this is something that you can't, you know, concretely see, touch, and feel. So it is our own peril that we can take this risk of completely ignoring this mental quality. So when we talk about teaching secular ethics education, some people use the word secular ethics, some people use the word humanistic education, some people use the word universal education, but we are basically talking about the fundamental human values. And human beings must have value, just like the money. If the money has no value, we cannot buy anything. So even ordinary things, they are, they are regarded important when they have a value, but the, the most important human being who is the user of all these things, if that human being itself is devoid of value, then you can see how much problem we are going to face. So as a reminder, I would like to point a few words, like, for example, a child is, as I give you the first example, then secondly, human physiological state is suitable for non-violence and not for violence. This is now scientifically found. And a child, for example, is happy with his playmates and loving company and not with violent, aggressive children. We all love plants and flowers flourishing in the summer and not when they die in the winter. We all like milk more than blood. And not only that, in our practical day to life also, ethics is really now found very, very important, crucial for doing good business, for health, even if you want name and fame. So sometimes I wonder why these politicians, many of them, you know, live a life supposed to be for name and fame, but they live a life just opposite to that and ruin their name and fame. So even for your name and fame, uh, the basic fundamental good human values are absolutely important. And then in our search for values, it is essential in the human history that the essential culture quest for human, search for value is an essential culture quest for the humankind. It is a quest into the nature of that goodness which gives worth, dignity, and nobility to human existence. Civilizations advance and flourish when they're active in this search and otherwise they decline. So the whole civilization, whether it will flourish or decline, is dependent upon how much we are able to preserve this value. But unfortunately, in today's world, in the hurry to catch up the material progress, concern for deeper moral level, you know, uh, deeper level of morality and spirituality, human values are relegated, relegated to the big issue. And as His Holiness has always been saying, just as we take care of the physical hygiene, it's much more important to take the emotional hygiene. So in order to draw our cur curriculum of secular ethics, it is very important to, uh, we need a map of the mind, how human mind functions, how certain kind of mind is harmful and how other kinds of minds are very, very productive. And that's why today the good news is many people have now started talking about emotional intelligence, emotional awareness, emotional mindfulness. Because at the end of the day, how happy you are, how much success you will have is very much dependent on the mind, your mental perspective, your mental outlook. What is happening around, you, you may not have the control, but how you would react to the changing situation and event is very much under your control. So therefore, mind is the key. And then some people ask the question, is it possible to teach the secular ethics? Very much so, because it's like mathematics. Everyone who has received a modern education can do basic mathematics, but not necessarily advanced calculus. So similarly, there are many basic things related to uh, ethics that, that, can be, that can be taught. So there are so many things to say, but I don't want to dis steal the you know, time of the speakers. So uh, one thing that I always remember is, like I had the great opportunity of working with His Holiness for many years, and whenever His Holiness gives a public talk, or even otherwise, at the, or when he meets somebody, at the end of the, that talk or that meeting, His Holiness would always say, be happy, be happy. Much of the problems that we see today in the world is a result of unhappiness of mind. And then that unhappiness of the mind is not necessarily due to lack of material you know, facilities, but it is because of you know, wrong mental outlook, wrong mental perception. So therefore, uh, it is possible that everybody can be happy. 
despite limited material facilities, if you know how to develop the right mental perspective. So I'm glad that we have two uh, wonderful presenters who are not only talkers, but who are doers, because they have been working extremely hard to come up with this curriculum for secular ethics education. We also use the word social, emotional, ethical education. So, uh, Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Geshe Lakdor, and uh, Your Holiness, good afternoon. I'm both honored and happy to be here with you to share some of the latest research in the area of social and emotional learning that we all call, also call educating the heart. Um, I want to start with a quote by you, if that's okay, um, one in which um, you've said that it's vital that when educating our children's brains that we do not neglect to educate the heart a key element of which is has to be nurturing of our compassionate nature. And for the past couple of decades, I have really spent my career looking at fi to find ways to educate the heart of children, to find how do we create the context to create empathy, compassion, altruism in children. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna start with a bit of a story um, to give you a context of, um, of how we educate the heart in schools and give you an example of a teacher doing that. Then I'm going to give an introduction of so to social and emotional learning. And I know you're familiar with that. You've been working with Dan Goleman for a number of years and he really created the field. And as Geisha Lakdor said, it's called a number of different things, secular ethics or humanist education. I'm gonna tell about five recent scientific findings that we know now that really has transformed our understanding because now we know we can teach these social and emotional skills or secular ethics. And the science is really new, that it's relatively new of what we know. And then I'm gonna talk about some future directions. But before I begin, um, I do wanna say, um, you have a f good friend, am I correct? <laughs> yes, that's your good friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And he has actually said, that educating the mind without educating the heart has produced brilliant scientists who have used their intelligence for evil. And how critical it is to, in fact, educate the heart. That we've had a lot of discussions about science and advancing neuroscience, but part of all of that should also be a conversation about educating the heart, teaching empathy, compassion, and altruism in children, and that can be done. So I'm going to begin with a story um, just uh, to illustrate how you can, how teachers, when children are very, even very young, can use opportunities in the classroom or even parents at home to teach children compassion and forgiveness. And it's actually a story about one of my own children. Uh, my son, Griffin, who is 20 years old now, when he was three years old, I went to go pick him up at his daycare. He was at a childcare situation. And I got there and the teacher took me aside and said, Griffin did something today. And I said, well, what happened? She said, well, he and a friend were fighting over a block to play with. And Griffin reached out to his friend's face and scratched his friend's face because he wanted the block. And I said, what did you do? Now, typically in those kinds of situations in the US and in Canada, children would be sent to the corner to sit in a chair by themselves. We call it a timeout. They'd have to be sent away. But this teacher did something different. But this teacher, I asked her, what did you do? And she said she went to the little boys who were sitting there, and the little boy with a scratch on his face was crying. And she asked my son, Griffin, how do you think your friend is feeling? And he said, sad. He said, well, why, why do you think he's feeling sad? And Griffin said, I scratched his face because I wanted the block. And so then the teacher said, well, what can you do to help your friend feel better? And so the little boys talked and they came up with the idea of a cold towel on his face till it felt better. And so the teacher took the Griffin over to the sink, ran, ran the cold water on the towel, wrung it out, and put two little chairs facing each other with Griffin holding the cold washcloth on his friend's face to, until he felt better. And then they went off and played. And what an opportunity for teachers to teach compassion, forgiveness, and how you do, how you can make another 
pe person and repair something that has gone wrong every day. And those situations happen all the time. And they're part of teaching, educating the heart. But why now do we need to educate the heart? And I argue now that children today, particularly under increased stress, there's a number of stresses you hear in the United States. There's higher levels of anxiety, depression among young people. And we know now there's recent research saying that stress is contagious, that emotions are contagious, and that even when you're not stressed and you're around a group of people who are highly stressed, that you actually catch it. And a study that we did with teachers, we found that teachers who came into the classrooms with higher levels of stress, that their children, their students also had higher stress, and we assessed it through cortisol to look at physiological reactivity. So those children all had higher levels of cortisol when their teachers had more stress. We also know from recent research that children today, the research is showing, are more self-absorbed and less empathic than in previous generations. We're seeing that there's been a decline, especially in empathy. There was a study that followed college students from 1979 to 2009 and found that students decline in empathy that they had, especially since the year 2000. Now, why is there a decline in empathy? And it could be lots of things like technology, maybe they're more self-conscious, maybe the higher levels of stress, the development of more destructive emotions that interfere with their empathy. So what now is the solution? And I'm going to go to you, who has been really talking about this idea of secular ethics for a long time. And another quote by you um, that I'm actually going to put on my, my glasses to read because it's kind of far away over there, um, that we know if each of us can learn to relate to each other more out of compassion, with a sense of connection to each other and a deep recognition of our common humanity, and more important, to teach this to our children, I believe that this can go a long way in reducing many of the conflicts and problems that we see today. And, and you've said this, and, and to let you know that actually this is now happening around the world, that these ideas, and we're calling it social and emotional learning. And social and emotional learning refers to the processes by which children understand their emotions, recognize emotions of others, are empathic, resolve conflicts in a peaceful way, and make responsible decisions. And this movement of social and emotional learning is growing throughout the United States, Canada, and either, even other parts of the world, including here. And, um, and one thing you, uh, you might remember that in British Columbia, Canada, they have now made it a part of the BC school system that all children from five years old until graduating high school are going to have social and emotional learning. So, and, and I want to thank you because you've actually influenced that by your visits to Vancouver um, through the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education. So now I'm going to just tell you a, a, a few of the scientific findings that I think you might find interesting, what we know now about educating the heart. Um, I've spent the past couple of decades and you know, trying to answer these questions, how do we do this? And I'm going to sh share with you some of my findings as well as some of those as others. So when finding number one, we know that if children have these social skills or social and emotional skills early on in childhood, that they're more likely to be successful as adults. A recent study found that children who were rated by their teachers when they were five years old as more helpful, more caring, more cooperative, that they were more likely to finish high school, to earn a college degree, and also find stable employment. That these were the skills of, above and beyond academic achievement that predicted their life success and their happiness. We also know that these skills are malleable. Um, you can teach them, that you basically, they're, through neuroplasticity, we now know that you can teach empathy, you can teach compassion, that children are able to learn these. And a recent meta-analysis of 270,000 students found that those children who had a social and emotional learning program, sometimes during their schooling, compared to those who did not, 
were more likely to develop social and emotional skills, but also do better in school, have higher academic achievement. So when teachers argue, we have no time to educate the heart, to focus on this, it actually doesn't take away from a academic achievement, it actually enhances it. So um, we really need to get that out there. I don't think enough teachers um, and even parents know that that to be true. The, other, the third one is that we have really underestimated children's capacities for being good. That um, there's now recent science showing that children as young as a few months old already have a sense of morality. And there's scientific experiments happening to see, will children help? So some of the work that has been done, oh, here's uh, Dr. Keltner, who I'm sure you've, you've met before from California, has said it's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the kindest. And some research being done um, that was done in um, Germany in the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Psychology has been showing that actually even toddlers as young as 18 months old will help will behave altruistically. It was always thought that we're born with this innate sense of aggression, but they're now really making the case that we're actually born with a sense of altruism. The idea that how we've survived as a human species is because we have a compassionate nature. So my colleague, I'm gonna show you a video, I hope it works. Um, so my colleague, Felix Wernikin, actually set up experiments with young children, toddlers, to see if they would help someone without any expectation of reward. So altruism is defined as helping without expecting something in return. And they set up the experiment so that an adult who they didn't know at all needed something, had a block, and they wanted to see if even a young child that was just 18 months old would help without any reward. So let's watch the video and see what they found. So they've done a number of experiments with these young children. And first of all, think, we often think that children can't take another person's perspective. But here, that young child at 18 months old had to think about what the other person wanted, had to take their perspective, had to think about how to help them, and then carry it out. And they've done this in a number of experiments, showing repeatedly, even when the parent is not there, or even when the adult is not even paying attention, the child will continuously help. So because we have that, what, what they talk about, this sort of human altruism, and from an evolutionary perspective, our goal in education is to nurture that compassionate, compassionate nature, to find the opportunities to help that grow and thrive. Um, and I'm afraid sometimes in our education system, we do things that are against that compassionate nature by comparing children all the time and, and things like that. The next one is that we also know from research uh, that social and emotional learning programs not only lead to kindness and happiness, but they also improve your health. Um, and I'll give you some examples. A recent um, study I've been doing of a program called the Random Acts of Kindness. Um, it's a curriculum that helps children learn about their emotions, destructive emotions, learn kindness, friendliness, um, and, um, and also be able to help others. And we did a whole experiment to see if children who were in um, classrooms that had this curriculum versus those children who did not. And we did pre-tests and post-tests, and we found that children who had random, who had this program in their classrooms, increased in happiness. They became happier. They increased in empathy, kindness, intrinsic pro-social motivation, which I'll tell you, it's kind of jargon. It, it actually means helping someone, not because you get a reward, because it's the right thing to do. They liked their peers more. It created a sense of connections in the classroom, even created the teacher being more close, feeling more close, and it decreased antisocial behaviors. Now, the next question we had was, can actually helping others, can altruism actually improve your health? So we did a study with 15-year-old students, 
And what we did was So 15-year-old students, and we did an experiment. We took 106 15-year-olds, and half of them we assigned to do volunteering one day a week after school for 10 weeks. So an hour and a half they spent going and working with little kids, cooking and doing sports and doing activities. And the other group, they just did what they usually do after school. But because we are interested in looking at their cardiovascular health, we took their blood before and after, to look at cholesterol, something we call IL-6, it's a, how you uh, process an immune system, as well as we looked at their empathy and altruism, as well as their body mass index. And what we found was fascinating, and we published it um, just last year, that we found that this volunteering, that those students who volunteered one day a week for, for an hour and a half for 10 weeks decreased their risk for heart disease. They lowered their cholesterol, their body mass index, IL-6, and those 15-year-olds who increased the most in empathy had the best effects on reducing risk for cardiovascular disease. So again, educating the heart could even mean educating the heart, you know, so it reduces your risk for heart disease. Um, we've also done experiments where we've looked at children with a kindness curriculum where we actually just for four weeks had, had 10 and 11 year old children do acts of kindness versus kids who did not and found that those children after four weeks, just one day a week, had to perform acts of kindness they became happier, and it also made them more connected to their classmates. So we know that these, that these activities also don't have to be really extensive, that you could see a large gains with just small activities. And then our, my fifth um, finding is that actually some of the research that we're doing now out of my laboratory is embedding mindfulness, with, mindfulness meditation with social and emotional learning programs. And we found very positive effects. This is a program that's called Mind Up. It, it's a program from, from five-year-olds to 13-year-olds. Um, and the children learn, do um, mindfulness practices every day. Um, this is an example of some children, from seven-year-old children sitting in a garden doing mindfulness. Um, and they're uh, listening, they're doing mindful breathing, but also listening to sounds of nature. And the children do this three times a day, but they also do um, activities like practicing gratitude. And actually, you were, I don't know if you remember that, when you were in Vancouver, you sat with a group of children and practiced gratitude with them. And that was part of the program, um, of the Mind Up program. So they practice gratitude. They also practice uh, acts of kindness, savoring happy experiences, learning optimism, a number of those different factors. And we found, we've done a number of uh, experiments with this study in a number of schools and have found increased attention. We've looked at um, something we call executive functions. It's a cognitive task that on a computer that actually sees if you can inhibit those natural tendencies, the impulses, and we found repeatedly that the children who receive this program actually become faster. They're more able to um, sort of stop those inhibitions. And we also found that the children um, increase in their kindness in a number of factors compared to the comparison group. Um, what's fascinating to us is that children in the comparison group repeatedly get worse throughout the school year. They actually decrease in things like trustworthiness and uh, kindness. So um, just to, 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 to end, um, I just want to talk about a couple of future directions where I think the field really needs to go. Um, we need to integrate ethical education into SEL programs. Social emotional learning programs are growing fast, but there has been a missing piece, and that is ethics, the idea of sort of morality and a sense of right and wrong. It's, been not, it's not been integrated in an explicit way. We also need to create a curriculum that goes across all the way to high school and into university. Often these programs are geared to the younger children, which is very important because it needs to be foundational, but we need to integrate more programs into high school and university as well. 
we need to really, the, one of the findings that's coming out so clear is we need to take care of the teachers. As I mentioned about the stress contagion, teachers who are highly stressed can't deliver these programs in an adequate way. They can't, if they, you can't be empathic when you're stressed. You're stressed, you have tunnel vision, you become so self-focused. Um, so we need to deal with that. And finally, we need to look at a systems perspective. We can't just go to a school in one classroom. We need to bring it to a whole district where, in fact, we have the administrative administrators um, from the super the leader of the school district all the way down to integrate that to support it in children and thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Kim, for finishing in time and valiant well in advance. Now I request Geshe Lobsang to make his presentation. Good afternoon. It is always a privilege and honor to present the work of Emory Tibet Partners and the work that we are doing at Emory to Ines. The most recent project that we are involved is on social, emotional, and ethical development, what Your Holiness refers to as the education of the heart or education, social, uh, secular ethics in education. As I present this particular framework to Your Holiness today, this has already been the third, through third revision, and this is the latest one we are presenting since last year. The re reason for refining the framework is so crucial because if we capture Your Holiness's this far-reaching vision, and as you have articulated in the Ethics for a New Millennium and Beyond Religion, accurately, this form of education can truly contribute to the modern education. I'll begin with an inspiration here, that uh, inspiration drawn from Your Holiness. Uh, the World Report in 2016, it is a report commissioned by United Nations of the fourth chapter report, third chapter, focused on promoting secular ethics. In that, the writers recognize the need for secular ethics, and they ground it in Your Holiness's vision, and I quote here, for all its benefits in offering moral guidance in life, religion is no longer adequate as a basis for ethics. Many people no longer follow any religion. In addition, in today's secular and multicultural societies, any religion-based answer to the problem of our, our neglect to inner values could not be universal and so would be inadequate. We need an approach to ethics that can be equally acceptable to those with religious faith and those without. We need a secular ethics. This is a, a quote from Your Holiness from the uh, book Beyond Religion, and they based on Your Holiness's perspective for an education that is the, that integrates the education of the heart in order to promote greater happiness. As Dr. Uh, Seanad Reichel just presented many benefits of uh, the social and emotional learning skills, but also the need for such the education of heart in our times. It reminds me of this first century uh, 
verse from Aryadeva, the first century master, where he says that for the privileged, it is the mental torment. For the underprivileged, it is the torment of the body. In brief, both are tormented day and night. That is, chole yike dunge te thamen namla luike tes. Dunge nyiki chiten te nyere nyere chepar ches. And uh, today, despite tremendous progress in material world, we still are facing many problems. And uh, this, Your Holiness, have recognized as the reflection of lack or the neglect of these inner values. Now, in terms of the need for integrating these skills, what some people refer to as soft skill, some people refer to as non-cognitive skills, basically empathy, compassion, and uh, kindness, uh, and training of attention. Uh, in education, it is true that there are many programs today in social and emotional learning, but the social, emotional, and ethical learning or the secular ethics cur curriculum has some very key components that it adds to. And uh, Daniel Goldman, a good friend of Your Holiness, who has long uh, written uh, much about the social and emotional learning and is one of the founders, in his recent book called Triple Focus, he talks about how social and emotional learning curricula that uh, exist now would uh, need to be added with uh, the attention training. He says the next step in this movement is attention training, and another important part is caring and compassion. In fact, he goes so far to say that, in fact, educating or education of the heart should be the state of the art in education. And uh, so, in the secular ethics curriculum or the SEED, social, emotional, and ethical development curriculum, we uh, attempt to bring the attention training and the compassion. But also, uh, ethics has to do with doing the right decision, taking right action. And that involves also understanding of the complex systems or the, the context. And that's why the systems awareness is another important part that uh, Daniel Goldman and uh, uh, the other scholars have uh, recognized. And this is something that we try to bring. And of course, the uh, the ethical engagement is the, the key to that. Now, in this framework that we have uh, developed, uh, I must say that uh, we have a very strong and dedicated group of people. Some of them are here uh, uh, today. Uh, some, about 20 or so teachers have, for last year or so, have been working to develop this curriculum. And we are guided by the great minds like the Dr. Seanette uh, Reichel, uh, she is here, but Daniel Goldman, Linda Lentieri, Mark Greenberg, Geshe Tutenjambala, and others who are well-versed in uh, the social-emotional learning, but also who are very familiar with Your Holiness's uh, vision and uh, uh, understanding. So, this framework focuses on uh, th in the three domains, personal, social, and systems, the larger society, if you will. Um, in order to bring transformation at the level of individual uh, in, in interaction with the society, but also at the larger, at the, the global level, what can guide us are the three crucial uh, skill sets, if you will. Awareness is one part, compassion is another. And awareness and compassion combined can lead to an engagement uh, that is meaningful and uh, constructive. In the, uh, this um, framework, as you can see, that these three domains and three dimensions uh, are uh, broken in nine components. Um, and uh, in the first column on the left side, as you can see, that, that is the column of awareness, attention, and self-awareness. When it comes to the personal level, it's important to have the awareness of 
emotions and the feelings and thoughts without such awareness, uh, one would not be able to monitor or manage. Therefore, attention is the key to uh, having the, the awareness of one's own thoughts, feelings, emotions. Um, the second part, the interpersonal awareness, interpersonal awareness uh, has to do with when we interact with others uh, in day-to-day -day life, our awareness of others, such as empathy and so forth, would be, become uh, crucial. If we are out of tune with how others are feeling, we, could, we would not be able to have meaningful interaction with them. And then appreciating interdependence when it comes to taking actions and decisions, particularly where it is quite complex, such some larger complex issues, there having an appreciation or understanding of the larger context is the key to taking actions. Many of the actions at some of those we discuss in this conference, like abortion and so forth and so on, uh, global environmental issues and like that, there are no easy and uh, answers or quick fixes, but having a larger context, uh, understanding of the larger context, what may be referred to as systems awareness, is the key. The compassion, uh, Your Holiness uh, has, uh, Your Holiness, you have uh, emphasized that the compassion is the key to ethics. Uh, and uh, when, when it comes to personal level, self-compassion, it, uh, it it's something that uh, in um, our community, it may seem somewhat of a kind of the uh, mismatch, uh, but uh, self-compassion understood as uh, a certain uh, frustrations and uh, certain levels of uh, the uh, self-doubt, uh, lack of self-worth, uh, a sense of inadequacies and so forth and so on, uh, these are affecting uh, the health and lives of many people in the West today. And I think that the awareness of one's own emotions can be brought to inform uh, ways to dealing with, with self-doubt and self-inadequacies uh, and uh, uh, certain setbacks that we feel. But then when it comes to uh, the other, interacting with others, that's where the compassion, the compassion for others, uh, not necessarily on a larger level, but just with our co-workers and the people with, we live and work uh, with on a day-to-day basis. That part is where the empathy and the, uh, is required and the compassion with the, the bringing a greater awareness of others' needs and feelings and so forth. If we are aware of our own needs, feelings and so forth, uh, then we have a basis to understand where others are coming from. And in that way, that our relationship interaction with others can be skillful and meaningful. Um, now, the third part, with, with, uh, when it comes to uh, the recognizing common humanity, that has to do with uh, um, expanding our compassion to uh, beings beyond our immediate uh, uh, circles. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the expanding it, then common humanity, Your Holiness, as you have reckon, uh, articulated in the Beyond Religion, that two principles are so uh, such a key to uh, secular ethics that is common humanity and the, the interdependence. So the common humanity here, as we can uh, see our own place in a larger society, uh, then recognizing that other beings, whether they are, uh, they, they fall in our circle of people or they are uh, strangers, or even people who may differ from us, uh, who may be different in color, religious orientation, ethnicity, so, uh, socioeconomic background, and so forth. But recognizing that they too are human beings, that we all have the deep desire to be happy and to be free of suffering. And it's through this integration of larger perspectives and the recognition of our common humanity, then the the action that can flow will be the actions that uh, 
address larger issues like the environmental issues or the largest uh, economic issues and uh, so forth. So that is at the level of community and the global engagement. So in that way, we see the, the, the ethics is a meaningful interaction, that whether it has to do with uh, restraining our own uh, destructive actions when interacting with others, engaging in meaningful, skillful ways with others, or to engage uh, in activities that address larger issues that, uh, face, that the humanity faces. Now, uh, of all this, uh, Your Holiness, uh, you ha as we have been talking here, the, one of the, the key uh, the tools for uh, informing our own actions uh, is our own mind, our own emotions. And that's why having the map of emotions, Your Holiness have emphasized, is Uh, and uh, when it comes to educating the children from very young age to high school level, of course, uh, this needs to be uh, appropriate uh, to age groups. So therefore, that uh, we have uh, drawn from various models of uh, identifying different forms of feelings and emotions and so forth. For example, this first part, it has to do with uh, recognizing the feelings uh, and the needs, uh, basically, for young children. When the young children uh, at age of four uh, to ten can be taught to identify very basic emotions like sadness or the anger or the uh, feeling lonely and so forth and so on, but then pointing out wh why do they feel this? What these emotions are and why do they feel? And in that way, then they can uh, address that how, um, when someone feels sad, what, what is the need? And then the, to address th those needs. Uh, at a, a little bit uh, older level, like ages 11 to 14, for example, we could use uh, Paul Ekman's Atlas of Emotions, Your Holiness, uh, as you have uh, encouraged uh, Dr. Ekman to uh, create the Atlas of Emotions as he is the expert in emotions. He has a model of five basic emotions like fear and the disgust and the uh, in joy and anger and so forth. But then also, they, um, the, each of these emotions has many different gradations. So they come in the families and that students can be taught about these different degrees of emotions that, and also uh, what uh, what are the impetus or the, what trigger those emotions that where they come from and so forth. Um, and uh, in this way, that the, the in, also the intensity, the, the, uh, at what level they may be uh, appropriate, what level they become uh, inappropriate. And uh, so there is a whole range of uh, literacy in emotions that can be taught based on the models uh, that are informed by the evolutionary biology uh, developed by people like uh, expert like uh, emotional uh, expert like uh, Paul Ekman uh, and so forth. Uh, but there are other maps of emotion like uh, Richard Davidson, another good friend of Your Holiness. Uh, Richard Davidson also has developed uh, a, a, a certain model of uh, emotions. He calls the emotional styles, where that. Uh, you, uh, resiliency, outlook, social intuition, self-awareness, intensity to the context, attention. There are where, where he re recognizes that there are emotions and emotions come in a certain, uh, uh, not uh, just one isolated event, but rather that a continuum. And at w one level, they may be important, evolutionarily speaking, for well-being, but then at another level that can become destructive, then how do we go about dealing with it? And in this case, particularly, uh, Dr. Davidson um, articulates these emotional styles grounded in the very neuro uh, science that they are apparently very specific neural correlates of these emotions and that those can, can be taught um, and then, uh, for the secular ethics, uh, what is 
what we feel that it, at college level, perhaps at the uh, higher, at the senior level of high school or the college level particularly, then we can draw from other models such as the one from the, the Avisamaja, Avisamaja model uh, of, uh, from the Buddhist uh, science of mind. And the, this is where the mind, for example, primary mind and the 20, 51 uh, modalities of the mind or the mental factors or the events. Uh, this is where uh, one can uh, very succinctly, very uh, sort of the uh, sophisticated understanding of what these mental factors are, like the feelings and recognitions and attention or uh, the certain discernment. These are mental factors that uh, that's where that uh, contemplative traditions like that is uh, uh, our tradition can really inform uh, in understanding this um, minute kind of and succinct kind of uh, characteristics of these emotions. Uh, when it comes to ethical uh, dimension, it's imp also important to understand of these mental factors, what are the mental factors that are uh, constructive, that promote well-being, such as the 11 wholesome mental factors, and the, what are they, that how, how they are understood, uh, and the, what promote them, how to cultivate these mental states, or the destructive or the, uh, the emotional states, such as six root uh, mental afflictions, the attachment and anger and conceit, ignorance, uh, afflictive doubt, afflictive views, and like, so um, this, each of these uh, can take a, a semester of course, but the, um, if since in the college they have four years to study, that they, this can be articulated. Um, and then uh, 20 w derivative afflictions, and uh, you know, uh, from the combination of the six root afflictive emotions, the 20, uh, the, and again, uh, I find it very interesting that how Paul Ekman actually has also a whole list of uh, afflictive emotions, when in the family of afflictive emotions, he uh, uh, he outlines many, many different kind of emotions, and uh, it would be a, a, a wonderful material to compare and, and to enrich the understanding of our inner dimension or the map of mind. And of course, in the, the uh, Buddhist model of mind, then there are certain mental factors that are uh, changeable. For example, sleep, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's part of a mental factor, regret and investigation, minute analysis, and so uh, and so forth. Um, now, what I like to uh, uh, touch briefly is um, the whole point of understanding the inner dimension, understanding the mind and having the map of mind. Uh, if it is about bringing inner transformation, we can uh, also uh, see how for example, a distorted cognition, it, 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 whether it has to do with a, a distorted perception or distorted perspective, a, a position one may be holding. How can we change that? What is the process of transformation? And the pramana, you know, model of the mind, uh, the typology of the mind, it presents actually that of the many different. Uh, typologies of the mind, one that is known as the sevenfold typology of the mind, uh, and in which a wrong or distorted cognition uh, first through the process of first to, to kind of, you know, to insert some degree of kind of doubt uh, about a certain perception by showing certain uh, perspective and so forth, eventually that can turn into what many call the correct assumption and at that point, uh, also, what is needed is that in order for the wrong or the perverse or the, the corrupted uh, view to change into uh, the valid or the correct understanding, then there's a whole process of utilizing the logic and reasoning. Uh, and uh, that process, then a, a critical thinking, critical analysis uh, that uh, leads to uh, inferential cognition when it comes to some abstract 
uh, concept like impermanence or the interdependence, emptiness, uh, and uh, and uh, and merely having the inferential cognition is not that. Uh, just having an understanding is not enough. Awareness that has to, has to be deepened, and that process that when it is repeated again and again, then it becomes sub subsequent cognition, and through the repeated meditation or the familiarization, uh, then that can eventually turn, turn into the, what is called the non-conceptual or the direct perception of this, uh, this, uh, the fundamental aspects of our reality. You know, when we attune to those realities, then they can erode the very the erroneous perspective and views, uh, and uh, therefore leading to the, uh, the, the, the ha happiness and so forth. So, the uh, strategies for teaching these uh, maps of mind and uh, uh, the, the perspective about our uh, nature and so forth, um, and the, we, we use critical thinking as an important part, the, what His Holiness calls analytical process. Analytical process is the key when it comes to um, those aspects of our life which is not readily evident. And there's, that's where the analytical process is important. We uh, also uh, intend to incorporate contemplative exercises, creative expressions, cooperative learning, learning in the, the students will love, learn in groups, the group projects and the uh, social services and so forth. Experiential learning that instead of just giving lectures that by doing the certain activities and then through the service learning. But after all, that these uh, skills or that these uh, um, insights that they draw are uh, also consistent with the scientific uh, evidence. So, to, so uh, we uh, intend to uh, rely on the emerging scientific perspective which uh, Dr. Uh, Sean um, Reichel had so uh, wonderfully uh, presented to us uh, just a few of many such benefits that we uh, are seeing of these uh, inner, inner values. Now, the model of learning here is, of course, it's very important to have the support of teachers and environment because His Holiness not only the teachers, actually the family, the, the very parents. His Holiness often talks about the first teacher for compassion or the love are our own parents. And uh, if the parents embody these qualities and the teachers embody these qualities, if the compassionate classroom is created, then that culture can naturally create, promote uh, a more a secure uh, environment for the teachers to learn, if, teach, if, if the students to learn, if the students are not uh, insecure and the stress, obviously they will be able to learn more. But the information that is imparted, of course, there is a received form of knowledge, uh, content can be introduced to, but then critical thinking or the critical insight that in, emerges, the real focus goes on uh, having them engage critically uh, and the why we feel what we feel, why the others feel the, what they feel. And this critical thinking uh, as process is really important to have these insights of you know, the empathy and compassion uh, and the others also have the needs and feelings and so forth uh, and that, that can give rise to the forgiveness and uh, so forth. But then it need to become more of a disposition. That uh, if they really need to become, need, uh, if they were to become a sustained kind of character or the trait, then it will, one needs to go through the process of sustaining it and embedding deeply in, uh, into one's uh, uh, state of mind or the, uh, the experience. And that's the, the process of familiarization and that's where the, the an intentional or a, a, uh, creating a dedicated uh, space for them to really immerse in those kind of uh, experiences would uh, be helpful. And then, of course, that the end goal of that is uh, if one uh, embodies these 
qualities of compassion and kindness and the, uh, the ability to create space between a certain impulse and a reaction, then uh, one can, you know, uh, when faced with the certain challenges and issues, one can uh, uh, respond to the situations more meaningfully. But of course, this is a long process, so that's why, as uh, Kim, Kim mentioned, uh, in such a training has to be a long-term training. In fact, research shows that many social-emotional learning uh, curricula where they have the greatest benefits are found where they have repeated lessons uh, in. And, uh, and I would like to end uh, here with the aspiration that Your Holiness have expressed in Beyond Religion. Uh, and I quote, my hope and wish is that one day formal education will pay attention to what I call education of the heart. Just as we take for granted the need to acquire proficiency in the basic academic subjects, I am hopeful that a time will come when we can take it for granted that children will learn as part of their school curriculum the indispensability of inner values such as love, compassion, justice, and forgiveness. And I hope that such a time will come soon. And uh, with folded hand, I request for Your Holiness to live long, to see the realization of your far-reaching vision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geshe-la, for your wonderful presentation. Now we have uh, the two panelists. First, I will have Kim you share your experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, your Holiness, thank you. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be here, and I am deeply grateful for this opportunity to share this, our project with you. I also want to take just a moment to thank you and uh, all of Drepang Monastery uh, for sharing uh, Geshe Lobsang La, uh, Geshe Lobsang Tenzin uh, with us in Atlanta uh, for so many years. Um, his uh, keen intellect, uh, tireless dedication, and genuine and uh, persistent kindness is. Um, an insp inspiration for all of us in our work. Um, <clears throat> so as assistant director, one of the assistant directors at the Emory Tibet Partnership, uh, I really I come to this panel as a, a representative of a team of amazing people, um, including Carol Beck and Marsha Ash, who are here today, and also uh, Lindy Sedevendemi, Michael Romano, Jennifer Knox, and uh, Brendan Ozawa de Silva in Atlanta. They're here with us in spirit. Um, would like to also thank our advisors, such as Dr. Shonat Reichel, etc., who've been thanked already, but most importantly, also to emphasize the teachers who are so important to this project. And um, we are working with them in schools across the United States already, uh, Georgia, Colorado, with an opportunity in Montana. We have teachers uh, in India. We visited in Mumbai and Delhi, and uh, opportunities in Brazil and Europe as well. So with this in mind, um, my comments today are about the teachers, and we have realized that along with establishing this framework that's been presented and developing this, the content of the SEED program, what will be taught, it's also very important to consider uh, how it's taught. And so uh, developing a teacher training program, teacher cultivation program is a, an urgent an important part of the, the Emory project. So, um, you know, I, I thought that, let's see. You know, 
you know, there's uh, two competing analogies for teaching that I thought I would mention, and perhaps this can become a topic for discussion. One is to see the student as a kind of computer that's empty, and that the teacher fills this computer with knowledge and facts and software techniques. And another is, the other uh, analogy is to see the student as a flower or a seed that can grow in the proper conditions. And in that case, the teacher is more of the gardener who takes care of the soil and tends to it with the proper amount of moisture, uh, water, uh, sun, etc. And Dr. Shona Reichel's example of her own son, you know, uh, scratching his friend, and possibly, uh, you know, many teachers might have punished, you know, maybe even pushed away. But to have the teacher have the insight that there's another way to teach. Um, I think that there's a question for us at, at Emory about how to help teachers develop this skill, to have this insight, which way is appropriate given the context, given the moment. And so I think that um, we have many ideas about that, but perhaps it could be a topic for discussion here. Uh, thank you very much. Next panelist. The next panelist is Geshinga among something. Your Holiness, the spiritual masters, the Sangha members, the dignitaries, the scientists, philosophers, and friends. This is the last session of the symposium, and uh, the last session is on ethics, which is a very perfect designing of the program, because <clears throat> In Buddhism, every kind of intellectual enterprises is for the purpose of uh, transformation. Let it be academic uh, philosophical study, or it is um, you know, epistemological study, or it's a logic, study of logic, or it's a study of arts, or whatever. Finally, it has, they have to bring change and transformation in our personality. If this does not happen, then the entire enterprise of uh, uh, exercise is regarded to be um, meaningless. So therefore, the, finally, it has to be transformed in, uh, into one's, translated into one's ethical life with the transformation. So, your Holiness, you have conceived uh, the idea of uh, secular ethics, which I think is uh, brilliant and dynamic in many ways. It is based on a universal reality and common sense. Hence, it is not uh, only acceptable to, the, to all the religions, but also to non-believers. The system of secular ethics does not provide a list of uh, do's and don'ts. Rather, it provides a profound uh, philosophy of uh, universal re reality. The secular ethics provides a system of our mental components which are ultimately responsible for our ethical behavior. Many, most of the people are not aware of how many and what kinds of mental components are at play uh, in a single mental process. Many people are not aware of this. As we see that, uh, as a layperson, when we see a glass, we do not know how many elements are there in this glass. But a scientist, a chemist, can see how many uh, elements are there and all together how many elements are there in, 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 in the material world. Similarly, Buddhism has uh, 
worked on the inner mind and finally have uh, uh, come out with around 100 mental elements, which I think is a very uh, amazing and wonderful matching with these two wonderful traditions, this tradition of science and tradition of Buddhism. That in the material world, the science has come up with the, uh, about uh, 100 uh, elements, and the Buddhism has you know, come up with uh, about uh, 100 mental elements. So this is, one, is, one shows the elements of the inner world, and one shows the elements of the material world. And it's wonderful to see this matching. Many are not even aware that the negative emotions can be reduced and the positive emotions can be enhanced through training. Earlier, the ethics in general and particularly restraint of negative emotions like anger and the cultivation of positive emotions like compassion are regarded as belonging to the domain of religion. Your Holiness have devoted this, uh, devoted, uh, they advocated that uh, the um, compassion and uh, the generosity and uh, the ethical values are innate to human, uh, human being. As a result of uh, your uh, interaction with the scientist, uh, there have been coming up uh, so many convincing scientific evidences that uh, control over destructive emotions and cultivation of constructive emotions have immense uh, impact on our health and uh, our social behavior. For example, the anger, the nature, to understand the nature of anger, its uh, functions and Im its uh, impact on our mind, on our behavior, and on our social relation. At the same time, uh, to understand the nature of uh, compassion, the functions of uh, compassion, and its impact on our life and relation and social behavior are extremely important. We have uh, uh, listened to the two wonderful presentations and uh, shown us uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Shonas has shown the movie, which is really moving and uh, amazing to find. It is such an obvious evidence that the child at the age of, uh, at the level of 18, as old as 18 years old, right, can show compassion and concern for others. So with this itself shows that all these values are innate in human being. But unfortunately, we do not let them to grow in those inner values. Rather, we teach them discriminations and uh, based on language, race, countries, and things like that, which after some time, these are undermined by many other discriminative uh, uh, educations. Therefore, some of the uh, thinkers have even thought of de-education, educating, de-learning, de what they call as uh, what they have learned in the schools, which have uh, uh, given some wrong information about social life and human life and things like that. They need, needed to be de-learn de them. So now we certainly need uh, um, these uh, value educations and moral educations uh, in schools which can educate the children and bring them in the, the right direction and develop uh, these values uh, in, in, those, in, in children. So, so now as Gishe uh, Lobsna uh, Denzila has shown at the end of, which is in front of us, His Holiness's uh, aspiration to bring uh, value education in in, in the education mainstream, I think now it is the right time that, that now we have uh, uh, people and educators and thinkers uh, finding that the material facility is not to answer to our happiness, not answer to our um, the sufferings, 
and uh, not answer to bring happiness. And uh, there is a very strong awareness uh, among the scientists and also among the psychologists and educationists that there is a need of uh, educating and bringing the ethical values in education. And there is, of course, the scientific uh, evidences which proves that uh, these, uh, that uh, uh, the compassion and uh, loving kindness are not only good for oneself, and, uh, but also it is good for social life and uh, humanity at large. So given that uh, this, now the time has uh, ripened that uh, we have a very good environment on, in which uh, we can develop this kind of curriculum which is being developed in Emory University and some effort is being made in India also to provide uh, uh, ethical education and uh, the, the uh, secular ethics education in some of the Indian schools and uh, uh, you know, primarily to give some educations to the teachers and then eventually take them to the schools. So with these uh, uh, hopes and aspirations, I hope that uh, um, the, as, the, the wishes of His Holiness uh, will eventually be fulfilled at, at the global level. Thank you very much. So we are making this discussion on secular ethics not simply as a dry intellectual exercise, but by nature we all want happiness, do not want suffering. And I have asked these questions to many people in many places, do you want happiness? Interestingly, everybody says, I want happiness. Then I ask a second question, how long you want happiness? <laughs> then they all smile, <clears throat> they all smile and laugh. By smiling, they are saying, when it comes to having happiness, it's not a question of a few days. We, we want as, as durable happiness as possible. So this is a basic reality. At the same time, it is also very evident and clear to all of us that we are suffering from many kind of disharmony or conflict and so forth. So how are we going to fix this? That is the crucial point. And do not get surprised if the solution is not coming from science. Solution will also not come from religion. Solution has to come from man himself. And the solution can be found by being realistic. By, as we, as we say in Buddhism, not just looking at the appearance, but going beyond the appearance and understanding the reality. So I'm tempted to just read a few lines which I've noted down for the benefit of all the listeners. There are several accounts illustrate that by showing lo love and kindness or simply by exuding thoughts of love and compassion, the violent nature can be made to become calm. We cannot stop the suffering of the world at one go, but we can only stop it in our mind because we know our minds and we generate anger, hate and jealousy in our mind. Western scientists have found that 80% of our illnesses such as rash, diabetes, backache, heart attacks are due largely to defilements caused in the mind. Psychiatrists have found that though there is temporary relief for these illnesses through medication, they come again, they recur because the cause remains within our mind. It is also, it is also found that, that frequent anger and hatred produce chemicals which reduces our immunity to illnesses. When we lose our kind thoughts and develop anger and hatred, immunity falls. Our brain is hardly 2% of our body size, but it is said to be using 20% of our oxygen. Negative emotions have been found to use up more blood and frequent anger and headed cause psychological aging. So you can clearly see that you die before the time to die, you age before the time to age. So is this what you want is the challenging question. Practice of meditation of loving kindness can work wonders. 
scientists have proved that meditation for loving kindness restores chemical balances in the body and even cholesterol levels fall. So it is from there you can clearly see how important it is to find the reality and live a life in accordance with the reality for our own benefit. So it is for that purpose, it's very, very crucial for us to talk about the, the, the secular ethics, which is not just based on some emotional, you know, feel-good practices, but based on wisdom or, you know, understanding of the reality. So, therefore, it is a really, really wonderful opportunity for all of us to work towards this area to, to promote peace and happiness among everybody. So now I will open the floor and uh, if anybody has any comment, observation, please. Um, thank you for these terrific presentations. Um, and I'm, I'm at Emory, but I'm not a part of the Secular Ethics Program, so I can say honestly um, and objectively that I'm super impressed at what has been accomplished in a very short space of time. Just one thing to say, I've been thinking about your challenge the first day, Geshe La, when you said it's great that we have these terrific ideas. What are we, how are we going to act? And so now you're saying this again, how are we going to act? And so we have some good ideas here. Just one thing that popped into mind, um, I do a lot of work with global health policy. And it strikes me that um, policy is, is distinctly lacking this kind of frame. So um, one thing to think about as you're thinking systemically is to also try to think how this can be introduced into the curricula of um, the, the venues that are actually driving policy because there's no such framework present in those contexts. So anyway, I just throw that out as a thought. Um, could you repeat that? Or is that a question? I, I, I couldn't quite... It's a comment. <laughs> the comment is that this is a terrific framework and you emphasize the structural factors, right? Which I think is really excellent because very often we target individuals. We tell the children, you know, be more compassionate, be more ethical. Do we do the same with children, uh, with teachers and, and parents? This is great. But you have the structural level, which I think is incredibly important. Um, many of the, the weaknesses with social science is that we often target the individual level and do not address the structural level. And what I'm saying is that, that this is great what you're doing, but I'm suggesting that if you want to target the structural level, that that policy, um, addressing the policy community that is really making decisions. This is business schools, um, Kennedy School of Government, government these kinds of venues could really benefit, I think. You could go to the United Nations with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was yeah. going to just comment. It's interesting you mentioned the policy because it's really the way of looking at a systems approach. So in British Columbia, Canada, where I am, where we've actually been working with the Ministry of Education, the science has been really influential, having the research to support it. And that's why just this August into legislation, the um, K to 12 curriculum, the kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum now has a specific focus on social and personal competency. So it now is into policy and teachers um, now have permission to do these programs in the same level of academic achievement. But I'd have to say one of the biggest barriers out there is teacher preparation programs because a lot of teachers are out there in the field who have gone through teacher preparation with no content related to educating the heart. It's been math and science and social studies. And so there you have this, even if you have the policy, if you don't embed it within actually the foundation of where, when you're learning to be a teacher, um, you're going to just lead to a lot of frustrated teachers um, who, don't, who now know they have to do it but don't know how to do it. So, I mean, there's 
different ways to get at it, but I would say that one way to start thinking of even how you start um, getting it into to teacher preparation programs in the Atlanta area and then putting the teachers into the schools that are in already doing that. I mean, it's just one idea. That is really both of uh, the comments from both of you are really helpful. And I, uh, you know, Kim, you have uh, been advising us for now several months uh, as we are developing this curriculum. Kim, and this, there are seven of the developmental psychologists and uh, experts in social emotional learning. And uh, one thing that you all have emphasized is to uh, train the teachers so that the teachers can uh, effectively bring that into the classroom, uh, which I think that it's really, really important, and we are taking that very uh, seriously. Uh, so we, we, we are, uh, at the moment, Your Holiness, uh, the framework is at, th uh, at three-third kind of revision. We feel very, very comfortable at this point. This framework uh, is quite sound, uh, and... Uh, And uh, as uh, my colleague Tim Harrison mentioned, there are 20 some teachers uh, from school systems, K through 12 sub teach at elementary, some middle school level, some high school level. They have been working with us to, to translate this uh, framework into actual teachable classroom activities and the, what they call the uh, learning experiences, mm -hmm. about 80 or so, so experiences are now developed, how to uh, bring that. And we have, um, at, at one of the schools uh, in Atlanta, uh, Paideia School, it's a private school, very, very, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, with great kind of the administrative uh, support. Uh, we have been uh, uh, working with a uh, number of teachers, but nine of them have uh, actually tried in their classrooms those activities to see how effectively uh, the students uh, are able to learn. Uh, uh, and the teachers themselves have gone through compassion training. Uh, and the, in fact, the, the school administrators, they brought 40 teachers to first uh, simultaneously for them to go through compassion training and also the f training in the, the SEED program, the secular ethics program. And the, so, so when they bring it to the class, they are somewhat familiar, more familiar, mm -hmm. not only familiar, but also hopefully they can embody it. You know, when the children behave in certain ways, perhaps instead of just uh, reacting with the punishment or the, the harsh words and so forth, perhaps they will embody a certain understanding and compassion. I, I feel that uh, the, for the two components of this uh, curriculum uh, I, I really adds to social emotional learning part. That is attention training and the compassion training. A very systematic way of cultivating compassion is something we find in the Lojong tradition, in the Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition, not as a religious practice. Of course, it, has, uh, it can be practiced within the religious framework uh, towards attaining full enlightenment uh, and uh, so forth, but also compassion, finding the very basic certain strategies for cultivating compassion. And those are the, the elements that I think that from this kind of interaction of the two traditions where uh, the, the work of His Holiness uh, can inform the modern scientists uh, and educationists. And this, our hope is to really capture that, you know, His Holiness, as he has articulated in his writings, but as best as we can capture it so that mm -hmm. it can be, uh, it can become part of the education system. So I will invite one or two short comments, then I will slowly wrap up the session. Yeah, Brian. 
So we sometimes talk about critical periods of development or time-sensitive windows, and I'm just curious whether there is a point after which this may be less efficacious than if it started earlier. The data would suggest not, but I'm just curious whether uh, there's any thought been given to really a, a, a crucial period of time during a child's development where if this isn't the case, then even going later might not help as much. I can um, talk about that. I mean, there isn't really been any studies, actually. Interesting. So um, looking at are there sort of windows that are more, more plasticity that you kind of teach it and then... Um, so there hasn't been studies, specifically, especially around social emotional learning, but I would argue that there are these critical transitional periods in development that we know in terms of neuroplasticity, the development of emotions and cognition, and those would be typically around five to seven years of age, and again, like 10 to 13 years of age, and then even later um, adolescence. But again, I think that um, the data are not there, but what What's really important, what's really important, however, is I, I think really having curriculum that starts right when a child enters school, and so they learn some basic skills that are all built up on other skills, you know, so I, I just really see this, like the seed curriculum is so critical because it starts and builds the foundational skills of emotion, understanding that lead up to these more sophisticated ones. But it, um, and then one, one other thing I want to say that I just don't want to get lost in the conversation is often we do these programs and we see how do the teachers like them, you know, how does it go for the administrators. We rarely go to the children and ask them how they like the program and get their advice about how to improve it. And I just want to make a case of how critical it is. These are the children receiving the program, and if they don't like it, uh, if they don't feel it's important, they're not going to really be engaged. And so all along, anyone who's doing any social and emotional learning programs always go to the children and get their feedback. And they are amazing. When you ask them, what do you think you could choose, you know, what make better, they have such great advice. I always found when I was teaching, my students always came up with better ideas than I could. So I just want to make that case that that's really, again, but even that, going as a teacher and asking children or a researcher, that again is showing compassion and caring and respecting their voice. Okay. You have one comment? Yeah. I'll be brief, but I, I wanted to add to what you were saying. We did a find about um, stress contagion. Um, I think it's important to pay attention to parents as well. Mm -hmm. I know you can't do everything simultaneously, but we did a very fine-grained study of Atlanta families, children, following children uh, ages four to five. Um, and looking at biomarkers of stress, both cardiovascular and endocrine and immune. And what we found is that the, these were affluent parents, well off. And what we found was that parents did a very good job of, of helping their children cope with going to school and so forth. But it was parental stress, particularly maternal stress, that strongly predicted stress in the child. And so, I think the parents, when we target the school, sometimes the parents get lost in the equation. So. No, that's no, great. Now I request Dr. Gail to do the difficult task of making a summary presentation of the symposium. Good afternoon, Your Holiness and everyone. So, in this first International Emory Tibet Symposium, I have had the great honor of being on the conference executive committee, along with Geshe Lubsang Tenzin Negi and Geshe Dagdor. And together we planned the contents of the symposium, which I will now attempt to summarize. The topics chosen for this conference, one per discipline, taught within the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, 
emerged from a series of over 30 focused discussions between ETSI faculty and esteemed geishas from each of the monasteries where ETSI is being implemented, Drimpung, Ganden, and Sera. And in these discussions, which I moderated, we found that certain topics kept coming up and generated much interest and rich exchanges on both sides. These topics tended to center on the most fundamental tenets on each of these two worldviews, Buddhist philosophy and science and modern science. Therefore, at this symposium, our intention was to create a platform in which these fundamental topics could be raised and discussed with equal contributions from both sides. Given how deep these questions are, it was of course never our expectation that we could do them justice in such a short period of time. Instead, we hope to have opened a greater dialogue between these two communities of learning for many fruitful exchanges to come. Your Holiness reminded us of the importance of keeping an open mind, of being able to hold multiple perspectives, multiple viewpoints. So why should Buddhists engage in dialogue with scientists or learn science? Some say that science can only talk about the conventional truth and not about ultimate truth. Well, as Michel Bidbol pointed out, ultimate truth in Buddhism is non-conceptual. It can only be experienced. The purpose of Buddhist philosophy is to provide analytical methods that point the practitioner toward ultimate truth. But we should be reminded that Buddhist philosophy, too, is conceptual and based on language, oral teachings, and scripture. Therefore, the approaches from science and Buddhist philosophy may not be as different as they first seem. As several presenters pointed out, science is very efficient in describing and predicting phenomena in the external world through the discovery of certain laws of nature, the finding that the world is a cosmos, not a chaos, as John Durant pointed out. And yet, these efficient laws are not considered absolute from the scientific perspective. They only operate within certain boundaries, such as certain spatial scales. If you look too closely, for example, the laws of Newtonian physics start to break down. They don't apply at very small scales. Yet, these laws are still used in many fields of science every day. The laws of Newtonian physics enabled human beings to travel to the moon, as it was mentioned. So these uh, laws are very efficient. Now, what about more modern discoveries, such as uh, string theory in physics, mentioned by Chris Impey? In these more recent theories, our level of confidence or trust is smaller. These theories still to need to be tested experimentally which brings us to the important notion of certainty. John Durant quoted from famous physicist Richard Feynman, scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, never complete certainty. This is an extremely important point to understand how science works. In the scientific process, we aim to achieve greater and greater confidence in our theories but can never be completely 100% certain. In fact, it's an essential feature of science that any scientific theory should always be falsifiable, meaning that there must exist an experiment that could potentially prove it wrong. The way that science progresses, as it continually does, is by testing its theories to find out in which conditions these theories break down. Then a new theory is developed to account for these conditions. This is how modern physics grew from Newtonian physics, for example, as, as we learned. Now, as Sunam Chupel explained, in the usual Buddhist definition, knowledge or valid cognition must be incontrovertible and certain. Knowledge is an infallible mind. 
So then, as Sonam Wangchuk pointed out, science maybe is not valid cognition. So uh, Mark Rizjord countered, well, could science be a form of valid cognition even without complete certainty? So Lopsan Gompo gave us some uh, interesting Buddhist perspectives on this question. He reminded us that valid cognition may not always imply that we must exclude all possibility of being wrong. In some Buddhist schools, you do not need to investigate every single case in order to establish the pervasion of an argument. For instance, this is how impermanence is established. In other words, different types of phenomena may require different approaches. We learned that Buddhist philosophy distinguishes between different levels of phenomena. Manifest phenomena, which can be experienced directly from our five senses. Slightly hidden phenomena, only accessible through inferential cognition and reasoning, such as emptiness and impermanence. And then extremely hidden phenomena, such as the subtle workings of karma. Now, it's pretty clear that science can investigate manifest phenomena. It may be able to investigate some slightly hidden phenomena. The question is open whether it can investigate extremely hidden phenomena. Uh, these are usually based on observations made by very special individuals, like expert practitioners. Would science consider these observations valid? So these remain open questions for us to explore in the future. So how is knowledge, knowledge established and what constitutes valid reasoning? Well, again, as His Holiness reminded us, we should not be too fixed in our views. And he gave us uh, examples on both sides of people who were holding fixed views. Uh, the example when he talked about the six types of consciousness to some scientists who would immediately reject it. But also the example of showing pictures from the moon to some monks who then would just not believe it and thought maybe it was a picture of Mount Meru. So again, the importance of holding multiple points of view. So in the session on physics, the question was, what are the fundamental constituents of the universe and how did it originate? Chris MP gave us a vertiginous ride through astronomical numbers about our universe in which only 4% is made of atoms. Uh, he described the Big Bang theory and explained that it has a lot of experimental support and very solid uh, scientific certainty about it, although again, not 100%, all the way back to the first few minutes of existence of the universe and maybe even to a fraction of a second. But is the Big Bang theory compatible with Buddhist views? Um, Tapke presented arguments from Buddhism that the universe has to be beginningless because of the reason that cause and effect must be con concordant. Um, so uh, this causes potentially some disagreement between the two views. Likewise, in physics, uh, we'd like to find the smallest possible constituents. So far, they're the quarks, although uh, Chris also mentioned string theory, which may break these down even further. Will we ever find out the most fundamental units of matter? This is still an open question in science. But we learned that likewise in Buddhist philosophy, there have been different arguments for or against the existence of heartless particles. So clearly we were not going to solve that problem at this meeting. Then when discussing the causal factors of the universe, uh, science simply doesn't know anything that could have happened before the Big Bang, or even whether that question makes sense. Can we talk about before the Big Bang when, in our current understanding, space-time itself originated with the Big Bang? In Buddhism, they also uh, reflected on the causal factors of the universe, and uh, one sutra describes ten kinds of causes and conditions, one of which being the karma of sentient beings as a cooperative dis condition. This was very mysterious to the scientists in the panel. Uh, how could this work, that the karma of sentient beings could cause uh, the universe to be created? So again, a point of 
wonder and questioning between both sides. Interestingly, within Buddhism itself, there are, as we learn, different systems to describe the constituents of the universe. Um, the Abhidharma and Kala Chakra were briefly presented. So already, there's a capability to hold different viewpoints in each tradition. A point of possible agreement in both sides about physics is the view of the four stages of evolution of the universe. Formation, abiding, destruction, and then empty or non-manifest state. These are in principle compatible with the views from current physics in which it would start with a Big Bang and then there would be a period of expansion and then pot potentially a period of destruction and a big crush. What remains an open question for scientists is whether this universe is the only one or could there possibly be many, whether simultaneously or sequentially or whether, whether that question even means anything. In the biology session, we learned about what is life and what are its origins, developmentally as well as evolutionarily, from both perspectives. Scott Gilbert gave us a wonderful explanation of development biology as a type of codependent origination, what he called the science of becoming, not being. He gave three examples from his field, fertilization, organ formation, and also developmental symbiosis. In Ngawang Norbu's presentation, we learned that the definition of life in Buddhism actually includes sentience, which was a cause of much discussion between scientists and Buddhists because based on this very fundamental difference in the definition, are we even talking about the same thing when we talk about life? For example, from the science view, life also includes plants, even though we do not consider them sentient, whereas in the Buddhist view, life does not include plants, for example. In fact, the Buddhist definition of life is a span which acts as the basis for heat or energy and consciousness, as Ngawang Nobu quoted from the Abhidharma Kosa. This is very different from the functional definition of life in science, in which an organism is considered alive if it can reproduce, respond to stimuli, use nutrients and produce waste, experience homeostasis, experience growth and development and adaptation. So now one wondered if we could maybe add to this definition the two features of life from the Buddhist definition, which were heat and consciousness. We also learned that evolutionary theory is a challenge for Buddhists also for other reasons. Um, for example, in evolutionary biology, there is an important role for randomness or stochasticism. And this, on the surface, seems to contradict the law of cause and effect. I think uh, many future discussions can further uh, determine whether that it's actually in contradiction or not. Another one was the role of altruism versus selfishness in evolution. Um, in classic evolutionary theory, selfishness is considered more principled than altruism. But this is also beginning to change. As Carl Gilbert presented, uh, he quotes, life did not take over the world by combat, but by network. And so natural selection may actually be selecting those who collaborate best, not necessarily compete best. And maybe the current evolutionary theory needs to be expanded with mechanisms to account for evolution of teams of species. But this is very current research, so uh, there is no uh, certainty about these theories yet. When it comes to neuroscience, uh, in this discussion we faced uh, a, a common problem of uh, translation and discrepancy in concepts. We found that um, when uh, translating consciousness, oftentimes uh, the word namshe is used, but it seems to mean something quite different in both uh, traditions. Uh, in Christoph Koch's presentation, consciousness meant being consciously aware, 
and excluded periods of sleep, and etc. Whereas Namche, we learned, actually includes both. Uh, and the term for being consciously aware may be a different one. So of course, this causes mi much misunderstanding right from the beginning. So for example, the statement by Christoph Koch that we could separate consciousness from attention and in experiments actually have one without the other, on the face of it did not make any sense in the Tibetan language because attention in their view is part of consciousness. So we face some terminology issues here. Uh, likewise, another similar problem is the lack of consensual definition about consciousness in neuroscience. Uh, as Christoph Koch mentioned, typically in science, we start with using operational definitions, and they actually vary from study to study. Only when the field has matured enough to the stage of writing textbooks do we start wondering about writing up definitions. This is, of course, very different from Buddhist philosophy, in which it is essential to start with precise definitions, as in Rojo Sangpo's very clear and concise presentation of mind consciousness in Buddhist view. So again, a point of misunderstanding between the two sides. So uh, another point, of course, of uh, disagreement between both sides in this case is the link between mind and matter. Um, in neuroscience, we really believe that um, mind is caused by the brain, by the physical uh, mechanisms happening in the brain. Um, but of course, we actually cannot prove it at this stage, but uh, in the scientific approach, we will keep trying to explain the observations that we make in our experiments in the current framework until we have observations that truly contradicted, and then we would have to add some other feature at that point. But we would not actually uh, try to do that before we reach that state. Um, so we want to also remind people that neuroscience is a very recent field of research, and so the certainty about its findings are nowhere near those we have in physics, for example. And His Holiness reminded us, of course, that uh, Western psychology is still at the kindergarten level. And so the same could be said about neuroscience. In the Buddhist view, mind is actually of a different nature. It is not physical. And it can only be caused by a previous moment of consciousness or namshe. And then because of that, it is argued that it actually endures beyond death and is therefore beginningless. So clearly, these views at this point uh, seem contradictory. Lodra Sangpo, among the different things that he presented, reminded us that there are different levels of consciousness in the Buddhist view, gross, subtle, extremely subtle. And Geshe Lopsang Tenzin added that these in the tantric system correspond to wind energies. So as Brian Diaz pointed out, maybe using a common language of energy could help us breach some of these discrepancies between the two views. Some unresolved questions that were raised by the panel that I thought I would repeat here were the question of ignorance versus wisdom or the distinction between distorted cognition and valid cognition. Can we see this in the brain? If we could, would that teach us anything helpful? Can we tell if a person has good memory or sharp mind, as His Holiness asked? To what extent it is helpful to do animal research to study consciousness, since humans may be quite different? Also, how to better include the subjective perspective of the subject in neuroscience experiments? And even, can we include the five omnipresent mental factors that exist in the Buddhist philosophy, feeling, discernment, intention, attention, and contact in neuroscientific studies? So how do we bring these together? Well, earlier in the symposium, 
An example came up multiple times, which was that of a very recent discovery about lichen, which is now understood just as of last year as the symbiosis of not just algae and fungus, as long believed, just these two pieces, but also a third ingredient, meaning yeast. Likewise, to explain at what stage a fertilized egg can become life, maybe we need an additional factor other than the egg and sperm, such as, as proposed in the Buddhist view, a subtle consciousness. So again, as His Holiness asked us to define sentience, we need collaboration between both sides. So a lot of these questions would benefit from combining both approaches. Finally, in this afternoon panel that we just saw, uh, we learned about very recent developments in secular ethics in education, programs for educating the heart. Kimberly Shernet Reichel showed us that uh, research can show that these programs have many benefits. They can promote compassionate behavior and even increase health. Geshe-Lub Santenzin uh, pr provided uh, a presentation of this new program at Emory University, and it combines elements from both Buddhism and science with Buddhist concepts of the mental factors from the Abhidharma and scientific concepts such as the models of emotion by Paul Ekman and also Richie Davidson. Future scientific studies, including neuroscience, will contribute to improve different aspects of these programs using scientific evidence and will help us find out, for example, at which age these children would most benefit and other things. So to conclude, I hope that everyone here enjoyed watching these interactions and understands that this is work in progress. There's still a lot of ground uh, to cover. There's still a lot of misunderstanding. But hopefully it's through these meetings and through training each other in each other's tradition that we will be able to uh, collaborate and hopefully benefit humanity. Thank you. So far. Thank you very much, Dr. Gale, for this superb summary. Finally, I would like to request His Holiness to give the concluding remarks. Oh, yes. Now, not much to say. Old person, a little bit exhausted. <laughs> As this morning I mentioned, my mind go to food. So now this moment, my mind go to sleep. Uh, I think simultaneous translation is your word. So let me speak in Tibetan.
Ja, da. No. To all my uh, friends, past for past few days, for past three days, uh, the presenters, the panelists, uh, genuinely uh, with great responsibility and sincerely, uh, they make the presentations and uh, make this discussions. I'm. <coughs> I would like to say thank you for that. And firstly, at the beginning of this conference, uh, when we have this kind of uh, meetings uh, with science, I have two objectives. One is, um, so far, uh, when scientists, when they do, they mostly they, they do uh, experiments with the physical world or the material, and it seems that they a little, to some extent neglect Exper doing experiments with the inner world, but now these days uh, they are slowly trying to do experiments or uh, to analyze the inner mind. Um, in um, uh, Buddhism, uh, in especially in, uh, in in Indian, in, in the past in the Indian uh, traditions, there's a very detailed um, tradition, the deep de tradition of analyzing the mind. Uh, so in Buddhism, when we talk about uh, the f when we talk about physics, uh, uh, when we when we have these discussions with f physics, uh, we we may have a uh, few things to uh, to say from our tradition to the, the uh, to the scientists. So that is uh, mainly for the uh, improvement of the education or the, our knowledge, to create new knowledge. Uh, and the, the discussion we had here today is uh, very profound. We have many monastics here. And you may have you may have here new 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 knowledge, and it may help you think about thinking differently. And also for the scientists, you you may have heard some new new information that will encourage you to do new research. New research. So so that is our our, our goal. The second goal is. Uh, uh, when we have uh, this kind of discussions, the ultimate goal should be not only not only to create uh, or improve our uh, academic uh, knowledge. Uh, generally, we all are uh, human beings that live on this planet, and we have around like uh, seven billion people here. We all are. Uh, same human beings, we all uh, uh, seek for happiness, and uh, we and uh, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are a lot of surfings, and this most of these surfings we just uh, purposefully credit for ourselves. If you think carefully, it is almost like unimaginable, unbearable. When you think that, oh, we don't need this, we want happiness. And deliberately, when we are creating this kind of um, uh, surfings for us, there's nobody who is creating surfing, uh, surfing uh, with the intention that they want to have uh, uh, surfing. Uh, but uh, it is all, all because uh, that we like this uh, uh, concern for others, and we always create a boundary between self and others, uh, trying to uh, win over others, and with that kind of uh, mentality. And then, then, then the, there's also this kind of uh, uh, element is also in our religious uh, traditions. Uh, generally, generally, the lo all the religions they talk about the compassion and training the mind. Um, the, the, but when we make the practice, uh, we put less uh, 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 less uh, uh, importance. Uh, 
on this. And so when we talk about religion, mostly they pay more attention on the ritual part. And, and because of that, on this planet, uh, maybe they are not deliberately doing, but we don't, by lack of knowing how to uh, walk, lack of, because of narrow-mindedness, lack of uh, altruistic effort, so it's we, are, we, we, we have these problems, and to, in order to, uh, to eliminate these problems, uh, whether you believe in science or uh, whether you believe in religion or not, uh, even whether you are a, 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 a businessman or a scientist or a um, factory worker or a farmer, uh, we have to think more about the uh, seven billion people on this planet, uh, at least to some extent to reduce the surfings that uh, we made. That should be our ultimate goal. And root, so for that, our generation is, is now almost gone. I am 81 years old and uh, it's not much uh, uh, importance for me personally, but as a, to, in order to have a better uh, world to live in, for, for, for future, maybe like for the, how long, I don't know how long this earth will live, but at least for the next uh, uh, 100 or 200 years, uh, to have a peaceful world is, uh, we have to uh, look uh, and work hard, and, and we have to, uh, is, uh, we, we have to uh, look for the younger generations, so the, the all, for all, all peoples, uh, they may go soon, but for the future generations, uh, if uh, uh, they are like uh, the, the present generation, like all the generations who always work for uh, self before others, then even the 21st century, century, century first, maybe uh, same as the, the 21st, 20th century where we, uh, we killed each other, we spent killing each other. Uh, so in, o in order to have uh, a 21st century that is different from the 20th century, um, uh, it is the responsibility of the new, new generations, next future generations. So when they were, they were born, we are all same. We all want happiness and we don't want uh, surfing. Uh, but but uh, for the elder generations, uh, the basic human nature of uh, compassion and uh, uh, Love, we didn't pay much happen to the inner uh, happiness uh, and compassion, uh, and because of that we face all these problems. So the problems that we face, uh, in order not to have these problems for the future generations, we, we have to work on education, and through education, uh, uh, through education, the mental happiness and the uh, physical health or and and uh, for he to in order to have a uh, uh, compassionate and a peaceful world we have to ha have to uh, do it through education the seat seat for this is in within us and uh, we have to make them realize this so we can't do this through religion uh, but um, through science, with the help of science, if we try to, through, um, through, through science, if we try to explain this based on uh, facts and um, based on facts, if we can tell them the importance of, of uh, compassion, uh, here, 
how it helps for your uh, present life, not to about not to talk, not to talk about the next life, uh, and. Uh, so, in order to have a different 21st century, uh, if we can teach these uh, young generations, oh, this is the only hope. Uh, we can buy the world peace by money. Uh, we can have a world peace through wars. Uh, so it, it only should come from our mind. And, and so, so, so through education, uh, we try to, uh, to create a uh, happy mind. If there's another choice, then we can think about uh, uh, different ways. There's no choice, no other choice. Uh, I, at present, uh, there's a lot of distress and there's a lot of violence and uh, uh, discrimination. If we keep on continuing, it won't be a... a peaceful and so it since it all comes from our way of thinking and only the education has the uh, ability to change uh, our thinking so our ultimate aim is and the responsibility is to have a, a peaceful world we belong to this earth and a part of this seven billion human being and if these seven billion human beings are not happy, then the in, there's no room for individuals to have a ha happy, happy life. So, uh, if as a human being, for human being, if another human being is, you know, uh, is starving and killing each other, um, there's no way that we can stay indifferent. So, as far as we can, it doesn't matter whether we will get the result, but uh, we have to put effort. So, uh, therefore, uh, to, uh, the, the ultimate uh, aim or the goal of having this kind of uh, uh, dialogues is to uh, is to, is to create a better place. Uh, we cannot have a, or create a, a peaceful world by praying. Uh, we didn't have in the past, and even in the future, we won't be able to have one. Uh, the, the disturbance is all caused by the men, humans, and uh, and and uh, human. We have to walk and. S try to change. So today, here, all uh, you participated in this uh, uh, s symposium, uh, uh, and uh, whatever we we, uh, we we gain through this conference, uh, and then when we go back to our, uh, our different places, uh, and and during that time. So this, uh, our ultimate aim should be uh, take with you and, and as l when you are alive uh, uh, through your profession, uh, you should uh, try your best to uh, uh, contribute uh, something towards uh, the world peace. I'm a follower of the Buddha. Uh, one of the seven billion human beings on this planet, I'm trying my best to do. I, I, I don't pray only, but I work, my, work hard. And so you should also think like that. Okay, that's all. Oh, in and uh, another thing is that today uh, at the Emory University has 
and also we through the concerned uh, uh, responsibilities from Emory University, I would like to thank them for the support and, on, and also from the Losiling Ministry, uh, uh, they let us use this uh, prayer hall and I would like to thank for that. And then there are other people who are uh, uh, Indians, <laughs> Indians uh, uh, who are uh, working for this electronics. We had some problem at the beginning with this electronics, but then also the translators, and uh, they, they try the best, even when they are sweating. Uh, they worked very hard, and uh, thank you for that.